Uh, so, okay, the, 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 this is just the title, um, title page. Uh, yeah, current uh, collab output collapse after the lockdown. Uh, on the left side, uh, you can see the, the graph. This is the index of industrial production, monthly, uh, monthly series. Uh, I have plotted it from January 2019 to January 21, just to get a picture of how output has collapsed. As you can see, uh, it had uh, just prior to the lockdown and uh, it had peaked around January uh, 20 and it fell by about 60%. If you take the January 20 to March, April 20, the output index fell by about 60%, expectedly, as we know, uh, uh, lockdown collapse production and demand. And as the as the lockdown started to get uh, relaxed after June, uh, output got rebound expectedly. So again, it reached uh, the best picture around January 21, which is almost close to what it was a year ago. Uh, but which means that the, uh, the calendar year, or if you take the financial year uh, 2021, which is a practically a zero growth. I mean, this is something expected because it's an exogenous shock, as we as we say in economics. Uh, so, uh, so this is the picture uh, as of today. Uh, okay, uh, industrial growth rate uh, during 2010s. So the immediate is a immediate uh, collapse is uh, understandable, and it will probably come back to the pre-COVID period very quickly. But the problem is that this is this needs to be seen in a longer term or medium term context, where industrial growth rate has decelerated over much of the last decade. That is a, that's a cause for concern, which many of us, uh, you know, in the in academics and policy making circles, have been uh, in making uh, uh, make, uh, making our noise about. So uh, here on the left side, there are annual growth rates as depicted by three series of, uh, of output, uh, three output series. So uh, this is, there is the GVA manufacturing that is from the national account statistics, gross value added in manufacturing, yearly growth rate at constant prices. Uh, then you have the uh, ASI, annual survey of industries, uh, annual growth rate for the same period and index of industrial production, which is the green line. Okay. So, uh, IIP seems to be not tracking the growth rate very well. So there are serious issues with IIP, but I have given it for the sake of completeness. Uh, but we can see that the ASI and uh, ASI and uh, national accounts give a identical picture, roughly speaking, uh, of uh, how things have panned out during the last decade. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is the picture, and you can see ASI is probably more accurate uh, because there are problems with the GDP series. Okay, so one can see that uh, between 13, 14, 14 and 15, it, the things were looking up, then collapsed. As you know, we had we had the demonetization, and then we had uh, the GST uh, and the rest, and therefore the the output growth simply collapsed. Okay, uh, so this is the picture, and uh, if you, yeah, you can extrapolate for the more recent period, things have been going down, not improving. Okay, so this is the second picture on the uh, medium term uh, growth. Okay, then comes the, along with this, along with this, the decline is also decline in the investment rate. So I can say the fixed investment as a proportion of output using ASI data for, uh, for the entire 2010s decade, one can see that it's been steadily going down uh, from around 30%. So which means in say 11, 12, 30% of industrial output was being reinvested, but this, the picture has, the, this ratio has come down to around 17, 18% by end of the decade. Okay. So that's the that's the, that's how investments have declined during the decade. Okay, fixed investment in GVA in manufacturing sector fell from thirty percent 
to 18%. This is part of a decline in the economy-wide fall in fixed investment GDP ratio. Okay. And correspondingly, savings rate in the economy has also declined. They have not shown it here, but that's also a, a similar scenario. Okay. Then there's a longer term context to this. And that is what I have been calling industrial stagnation. Uh, this I have defined industrial stagnation as share, I mean, uh, share of manufacturing or industry as a percentage of GDP. And this has stagnated since 1991. If you take the, if you look at the blue lines, that is for manufacturing, manufacturing uh, output or manufacturing value added to GDP has stagnated around 15%. Okay. And uh, if you take industry, that is uh, not just manufacturing, but also uh, electricity, gas and water, construction and mining. If you take that, that also uh, has been stagnant. Okay, the same holds true for the, for the more, recent year, more recent period, though the levels have changed because there's a change in the base year. There's a change in the uh, base year, therefore, but the picture of stagnation is very clear. Why am I bothered about the ratio? Uh, I should be happy just with the, with the growth rate. Okay. Uh, but the problem is the, in a, for an industrializing economy, before it reaches maturity, what's important is that the share of, share of manufacturing or industry should be going rising. I mean, that's a, that's a basic sign of industrialization. Okay. And somewhere the process of industrialization has got has got dented in India, unlike what has happened in much of Asia. If you look at China, if you look at the earlier industrializing countries, right from Japan to Korea to Taiwan, okay, all those countries in the early phase of, uh, of development, industrialization was the engine of it. Okay, then they became post-industrial societies, they become service-oriented economies. Okay, but India, uh, has somehow failed to do that after 1991, which is what I have been emphasizing, and that is shown in this picture. Okay, so to there are three sets of there are three sets of uh, uh, issues. One is the immediate collapse of output during last year. There is a medium term issue of deceleration of industrial output during much of the uh, much of the last decade, and this should be seen as a part of industrial stagnation which has been uh, which has been uh, which has been a major issue of india's development outcomes since 1991 when we started liberal economic reforms okay and understanding the slowdown how does one understand this slowdown? And so this is the so so far i have given just the bare facts which i think are essential to understand the plight or the status of industrialization in india Okay, so it is not that uh, this is not known. The fact that industrialization has suffered has is known to policymakers since the beginning of the last decade. Okay, uh, to address this issue, the government which came came into power in 2014-15 uh, started and initiated a, a, a program called Make in India. I'm sure all of you would be aware of this. You'd have seen the the mechanical. Uh, Tiger or a lion across the country, and make it India being advertised as a as the primary goal of economic policy of the current regime, political regime. Okay, so therefore, make in India is something which I'm sure uh, all of you would have heard about or seen about it, seen the its emblem and you know read about it. What are its main objectives? Its main objectives are to raise manufacturing sector share in GDP to twenty five percent by 2022 and create 100 million additional manufacturing sector jobs. Okay. As of today, the share manufacturing sector uh, employment is about 66 or 70, 70 million uh, workers out of total uh, workforce about 450 million. So that's the gives the relative size of the manufacturing employment. Okay. So to Achieve this goal, it would call for an annual industrial growth rate of 12 to 13 percent. One can do the arithmetic behind it. Okay. And obviously, such 
such a growth rate would call for a massive increase in fixed investment rate. Unless we increase investments, output will not come out. Okay, so that's it. that's the essential problem. Okay, <laughs> and why investment was not going up? In, as you saw earlier, investment rate during much of the last decade was decelerating. So why is it this? Okay, so government or the policymakers uh, diagnosed the problem as one from the supply side and not from the demand side. The essential problem as government saw it was from the supply side. And what are the supply constraints? Okay. Supply was restricted. This is the essence of the, the, the underlying I mean, the argument behind the government's policies uh, for uh, industrialization. Supply was restricted due to excessive state regulations and rigid labor laws holding back private and foreign investment. I mean, this is in essence the, the essence, the, the, the idea or the, the thesis behind the government policies being followed. Okay. Government believed that investments would have to come mainly from FDI. That Indian industry, Indian uh, Indian savings rate is already high, around 30 plus percent. And if additional investments are required, they have to come from foreign capital. Okay. And how would the foreign capital come? And the government believed that way to entice foreign capital is to improve India's ranking, India's or say attractiveness to foreign capital. How is this uh, revealed? How is this uh, India's attractiveness to foreign capital revealed? It can be by improving India's India's rank in the World Bank's index of ease of doing business. I mean, that's the, that's the essential idea. That if India's rank in the uh, World Bank's index of uh, ease of doing business rises, world will take note of it, and therefore greater investment will flow in, and the Maker India objectives will be will be will be achieved. I mean that's the essential argument behind the government's emphasis on on uh, on ease of doing business index. Hence, government spent a lot of its efforts to improve its rank in the World Bank's ease of doing business index. I mean, this is the point. So, uh, if you if you go to if you go to uh, government website of uh, Make in India, you will see a prominent place for ease of doing business index. And if you look at many many documents and statements of of Niti Aayog uh, officials. Okay, they almost identify make in India with improving ease of ease of doing business index. So they are almost seen as synonymous. And government has spent enormous amount of its administrative and uh, political energy to get this index right or improve its index. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Idea behind easy EDB index, the LDCs, the less developed countries, uh, LDCs are sorry, are shackled by excessive uh, state intervention or regulation, stifling private enterprise. In other words, if you put it in simple terms, it's basically an idea that free markets with minimum government regulation is best for attracting investments. Okay. Dismantling the excessive regulation will attract investment and boost output. Is essentially behind all the, you know, high-sounding technical terms. Is essentially an argument for let the markets perform and let the government withdraw itself in intervening in various markets. That is, market for capital, market for labor, market for technology. Okay, so that is essential idea. Okay, but. World Bank's EDB index gives a physical number to it. And there are various components of this index, uh, like you know, uh, kind of uh, how many licenses or how many permissions are required for an enterprise to be started. Okay, how labor laws affect uh, you know, employment of workers, and various things. There's a, there's a whole lot of index, and there are various components to it. Okay. Government during the last five, six years has spent energy on trying to get this 
get these uh, numbers right. In the sense, if the if the index uh, of say for a particular item for say getting uh, getting goods through the uh, ports to the ships, you know, if they can, if the rules can be uh, changed so that time taken to get this uh, this uh, uh, this administrative process can be eased, the government has sought to to ease that at least on paper. Okay, at least on paper, the government has sought to reduce various regulations so that India's rank improves in the index. Okay, uh, right. Uh, to achieve this, government started to dismantle various labor and safety regulations. Of course, there are business regulations. I'm not talking about that very much. But what's important is the is the labor laws. Uh, many of you may be aware that there is a there's been a there's been a raging debate in India for a long time that industrial labor laws in India, or more specifically the Inspector Raj, you know, is the principal constraint on entre entrepreneurs from doing their business. Their job is to produce output and sell and make profits and reinvest. I mean, that is a job of an entrepreneur. Okay, this job of entrepreneur is hindered by uh, by regulations and the inspectors who are seemingly seek, seeking to enforce the regulations. And in this process, there is a belief that it leads to enormous amount of corruption. And I mean, to use more uh, more uh, more glorified term called the rent seeking. Okay, and this is a hindrance, major hindrance for entrepreneurs from achieving their goals and also contribute to national health. So government has decided to dismantle various regulations. Okay. Uh, since 2015, mandated inspection to comply with labor laws has changed to self-certification by entrepreneurs. This is a very important change. Uh, See, earlier, at least as per the labor laws, inspector is supposed to enforce labor laws. And inspector had the, had the, had the powers to, to punish entrepreneurs who are not following labor laws. Okay. Surely there could have been cases of, of corruption. Nobody is denying that. But, but that does not mean that inspection is not required. Okay. So, uh, this is not just about labor regulation, but also about safety regulations. I mean, I'll give one example. I'll give one example. That is the boilers, you know, industrial boiler. Industrial boilers, I know industry steam, you know, steam is used in, 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 in manufacturing for a variety of purposes. So to create steam, you require industrial boilers, you know, and they are they work under pressure. And they and they are liable to. To, uh, to accidents, if the if the pressure is not adequately maintained or the machinery is not right, okay, then there can be blasts and they can and they can uh, they can cause injuries and it can lives can be lost, okay. So uh, and inspection of boilers is a very important part of of labor safety regulations, okay, and this has been dismantled in favor of what they call a third party inspection. So the idea is that entrepreneur gets the boilers, functioning of the boilers or the health of the boilers by a third party inspector or independent private inspector and certifies. And, and that is taken by the government to be true and, and thus gets rid of the labor inspector Raj. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So this is a this is a uh, uh, also for variety of labor laws. I, I agree, India has a large number of labor laws overlapping, and um, and uh, so today, I mean today, I mean, say since two thousand fifteen, these labor laws have been practically given up, and the entrepreneur has to self certify that the labor laws are being followed, and the government accepts the self certification. In fact, a, a large number of Private uh, agencies have come up, uh, like Team Lease. Team Lease is a very big name, I would have, as you would have heard. Okay, uh, uh, so they certify 
that you know the uh, the labor uh, labor regulations are complied with with self certification by entrepreneurs okay um, okay so this is a serious uh, change okay okay before we come to that in fact i'll just say that just a few days ago i wrote a paper in you know there is a online uh, economics uh, um, um, a digital journal called the ideas for india um, i wrote a short piece on the rising uh, the rising cases of industrial and commercial accidents as you have noticed there have been a series of fire accidents in factories and commercial establishments and especially hospitals if you just do a google search use and say uh, industrial and commercial accidents you will see a large number of lists large list there okay so i mean, that made me look into it and i think in my view uh, that is my hypothesis that this is an outcome of outcome of of giving up safety and industrial labor laws i have a short piece uh, which appeared last week in ideas for india you may have a look at it okay so but i will not go into it further okay i will go back to the main question about industrial performance okay okay outcomes uh, as i said india spent or the government of india um, and its major agency niti aayog spent enormous energy to improve its ranking in the global index of ease of doing business okay and india was very successful in doing that india was very successful in doing that and india's rank stood at to 141 out of about 160 or 170 countries in the world okay uh, in 2014 and thanks to the government's efforts uh, the rank has moved to 66 by 2020 and that's a quite a commendable achievement and in fact the honorable prime minister said that he is not happy with this ranking in fact he has said that he has asked his officers to that india should come to less than 50 i mean that's a target given by the honorable prime minister okay so therefore india is and has surely done exceedingly well uh uh okay uh exceedingly well in improving the uh, in india's ranking but what did it achieve is the after all the ranking is a is an intermediate objective okay the ultimate objective is it should lead to increase in foreign investment inflow investment growth and output growth have they been achieved probably not that is a cause for concern so surely index can be helpful after all it's a, it's a means to, it is a measure it is a signal it's it's a signal to the world uh, world business that india is open to business okay but india achieved success in the uh, in edb rank improvement but it did not yield what india was looking forward to that is increase in fdi inflows and increase in domestic investment and that is a, see as an economist as a person concerned about india's industrialization i feel the edb index improvement has not achieved anything for us okay so hence make in india goals has hardly succeeded that's my concern i'll show you the next graph where i have some picture okay here is a picture okay this is the this is i have reproduced from the paper i just mentioned appeared in the uh, ideas for india which I, okay appeared last week here are two graphs here you see the blue line which is just uh, uh, which is uh, there is no trend here okay a uh, blue line refers to net fdi inflow every year uh, net fdi is defined as gross fdi minus uh, disinvestments and uh, minus uh, fdi outflow from it uh, disinvestment perhaps needs some explanation uh, as you know these days fdi comes into india mostly in, by private equity agents agents they do not directly come from big companies like philips or intel or 
major manufacturing companies or major service companies. Okay, most of FDI is coming into India in terms of private equity. Okay, they are they are shadow banking agencies. They invest in in India in acquiring existing assets, not creating new assets. They don't act to capital formation, but they only acquire existing assets. Uh, and therefore, and their their time horizon is three to five years. Uh, so, so there is a uh, so there is a, after three or five years, they sell their shares in the Indian stock market or to the uh, the promoter agencies and withdraw their money. Okay, so if you see the uh, if uh, if you see the disinvestments by private equity is pretty large these days. So therefore, if you want to measure how much FDI has flown in, one should take the net measure, not the gross measure. Okay, and of course, and also as a percentage of GDP, which is what I have done. As you can see, the blue line that is net FDI inflow has hovered between 1.2 percent and 1.5 percent during uh, 2013-14 and 1920. There is hardly a trend here. Okay, so what? Therefore, FDI was not attracted by increased in, you know, or improved India's ranking in his EDB index. That's my, my main point. That India did uh, India bent backwards to attract foreign capital, but foreign capital is not enticed by what India has done. Okay. On the other hand, the, the next line, kind of look at this. This is the, the, the gross fixed capital formation as a ratio of GDP. This is the total investments taking place in the country. Earlier, I showed in the decline in investment rate for the for the for the manufacturing sector, and this is for the entire economy. Okay, uh, gross capital formation uh, has, as a percentage of GDP, has fallen from thirty two percent to about twenty six point six percent. This is unprecedented in the last seventy years. This is something which unfortunately has not drawn the attention it deserves okay never in the last 70 years has investments fallen at this rate okay and therefore how can we expect the nation's output or industry output to revive okay if the investment rates has fallen okay so ease of doing business did not increase did not increase uh, either the fdi inflow or in fact, it has seen a decline in fixed investment rate. Even the domestic investors are not investing more. Okay. So this I see as a clear evidence of failure of our policies to, to boost industrialization. Okay. Um, why India failed? Okay. So this is the point. Why did, why did, why did EDB index fail us? Okay. And here is my answer. EDB index is a spurious index. It's a bogus index without analytical and empirical basis. Okay. And I'm saying I'm very, very uh, using strong word, but, but very, uh, very uh, carefully, I mean, consciously using it because it has, it is, it's an empirical basis is very poor analytically to say that free markets always lead to better, uh, outcomes is also questionable in theory. We all have studied economic theory. There's nothing which says that the free markets are, are, are the best uh, economic system to achieve output goals or social welfare goals. Okay. So globally, the index, ECB, EDB index has no explanatory problem. World Bank's own research demonstrates it. Okay, this is important. The World Bank's own internal research, which, okay, uh, demonstrates it. Uh, and I'll give you one simple statistic. Okay. Uh, Russia's EDB index rank moved up from 120 in 2012 to 20 by 2018 without improvement in FDI inflow into that country. Okay. In contrast, China's EDB index ranged between 78 and 96 during roughly the same period. But as you know, China has attracted enormous amount of FDI. Okay. So this shows that this index has very little explanatory power. Okay, so that's the uh, 
I mean, that's a problem. In fact, I wrote a piece which was, uh, it's called, you know, uh, uh, Make in India. Uh, I called it, uh, why, didn't, uh, uh, why didn't the tiger, uh, why didn't the lion roar? I wrote a piece in 2019. I called it, uh, Make in India, why didn't, it, why didn't the lion roar? Okay, it was published in uh, an online uh, magazine called the India Forum. Uh, okay, and where you find a lot more details about, about both theoretically and empirically the shortcomings of the EDB index. Moreover, I have not mentioned here, I'll just say EDB index is a politically motivated index. Again, I'm making a strong statement and there is evidence for this. If you, if you are interested, you may please look up my EDB, my Peace in India Forum, we'll find it. Okay. The underlying theory that reducing regulation and increasing labor market flexibility improves investment is open to question. This is a, I'm putting it very mildly, India has seen a huge debate for over the last two decades that you know, labor market inflexibility is not a problem in holding back industrialization. There's a huge amount of literature. Uh, again, in my paper, uh, Ideas for India, I have given one of one of the recent uh, references to it. Those of you interested may, may look it up. So the notion that labor market regulations are a, are a binding constraint on industrial development or industrialization is, is highly questionable. Okay, that is my point. Uh, what's the solution? Okay, this here comes my view. Uh, see, problem of industrial or lack of industrial growth or industrial slowdown, as I've called it, during the much of last decade was from the, from the demand side, not from the supply side. Just to go back, you know, we have had the same industrial uh, laws or lack of flexibility, but during the first decade of the 21st century, that is 2003 to 2008, India, as we all know, India was growing at 8 to 9% per year. Industrial sector was growing at 9 to 10% per year. Okay, that's one when India thought India was, India was going to beat China or going to, you know, overtake China and become the, the fastest growing economy of the world. Okay, and if India, if China was India's, uh, China was the world's factory, India thought it will become the, it will become, you know, the back office of the world, right? If you recall, this was the standard, you know, narrative at that time, okay? And at that time, we had the same, same uh, industrial uh, labor laws, but we were able to grow at 10% per year. So, industrial labor laws, are not the principal, they, they can be a problem. Surely, when nobody's saying that industrial labor laws are perfect, far from it. Okay, there's a need for rationalization. But to say that that is the binding constraint, holding back supply and holding back entrepreneurs from investment is questionable very seriously. Okay, so then what is the problem? My analysis of this has been the following, that in the last decade, uh, industry, GDP growth rate as well as industrial growth rate slowed down significantly because, because of two factors. One is investment demand in India fell. Uh, as you know, from the demand side, if for an economy, uh, the basic macroeconomics will tell you there are four sources of final demand. One is the consumption demand, investment demand, okay, and then you have exports. Okay, so exports and investment demand have not done very well during the last decade. Okay, as you know, exports uh, exports as a percentage of GDP have fallen because the world economy has slowed down, world trade growth rate has slowed down. Okay, and that's something exogenous to the economy. We cannot easily uh, easily uh, you know influence that. Okay, but what can be definitely influenced is the domestic investment rate, right? And domestic investment rate was adversely affected because the private sector, which was the engine of growth during the first decade of you know of in, of twenty first century, you know when we had the dream run, we had the rapid growth of eight to nine percent. Private corporate investment was was the engine. But that engine faltered after the global financial crisis because it has been mired in deep debt. 
So the private sector is not able to enhance its enhance its uh, investment rate. Uh, therefore, investment demand has fallen. So we out of it is that is that public investment has to step in. I mean, this is the standard role which which Keynesian economics has 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 uh, has has given for public in the public uh, uh, public expenditure. Okay, so public investments have to be stepped up until the private sector comes back to its old self. Okay, in terms of uh, you know reducing its uh, debt and you know and its expectations about the future. Okay, but public investment have not increased in it. Despite a lot of a lot of rhetoric, including in the present budget, okay, at the ground level, increase in public investment has not taken place. If anything, the government has been desperately wanting to reduce public uh, public sector share and wanting to privatize public enterprises. Okay, when there is a threat of privatization hanging on on uh, enter public enterprises. Public enterprise management would be hardly enthused about coming up with new plans for investment. Right. So this is, I see, as a principal problem of India's slowing down, especially the industrial slowdown. Need to step up domestic investment to boost infrastructure and design industrial policies to reduce import and technological dependence. I have not spoken much uh, at all about the industrial uh, policies. To, as you know, India has become an import dependent economy. I think this became this uh, this shock or revelation came to us when during last year when we had a border skirmishes with China, and suddenly, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> Indian policymakers suddenly realized that we are dependent on China for some very critical equipment, like uh, like uh, like bulk trucks. Okay, for fertilizers, and of course the uh, the uh, and of course the 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 electronic hardware. Okay, and this has crippled India's output output growth in many industries. Okay, so India needs to redesign industrial policies to reduce import and technological dependence. Okay, to sum up, Indian industry is in dire state now. I'm using a very strong word. Okay, but this is this is the truth as I see it. Okay, there can be alternative truths these days, but this is my truth as I understand from the numbers uh, I have in front of me. Output growth has grounded to zero. Okay, Make in India goals set in 2014-15 looks like a distant dream or a mirage, with domestic investment plummeting and FDI not rising. I mean, FDI not rising as a proportion of GDP. Okay. To revive growth, India needs to step up public investment and redesign, redesign policies to reduce import dependence and achieve greater domestic technological capabilities. India has become an import dependent economy, technologically dependent economy. This is quite contrast to what India's ideals of self-reliance were when India started industrialization. Okay. These, to achieve these, India need to redesign industrial policy. In, in fact, India needs to rediscover and redesign industrial policies, which unfortunately I don't see in the horizon anywhere. This is my concern. I stop here. Thank you very much. I'll be